I'm corking the hull of my 24-foot Ranger class gaff sloop, and in this episode I'm going to show you how that went. And you may find it's a little different to what you've seen before. Now there are two types of fibre generally used in the Western world for corking seams. Firstly there's oakum, which is made from hemp soaked in stockham tar, pine tar. The shipwright then evens this out, rolls it into a sort of a loose rope, which he then loops into the seams and then hardens up in a manner that we'll show you later on. The other fibre is cotton. Now there's lots of videos on YouTube showing you how it's done in the USA where they use a soft cotton that's looped and hammered into the seams in a very similar fashion to the way they and we would do with oakum. We in Australia tend to follow the English style where the cotton always comes pre-spun and we tend to spin it even more when putting it into the seams. On my boat I'm only using a little bit of oakum basically along the stem and stern rabbits and along the keel, along the garboard seam for reasons that I'll go into later. Everywhere else I'm using cotton. Now I don't even remember where I got this one from, but I've used this first as I planked up, rolling a single strand of this cotton into each of the plank seams as I planked, so that because I was going to paint the inside of the boat as I went, uh, this would prevent the paint from bleeding out through the seams and interfering with later cork. I didn't film this at the time so now I'll show you roughly how it went. I've never owned a dedicated cotton roller so I raided the kitchen and got this standard pizza cutter and it works well. You simply hold the cotton up to the seam, roll it in with firm pressure and that forces it into the bottom of the seam. All the other seams in the boat I've been using the this Australian made spun cotton. I got a bunch from a retired boat builder down the far south coast, Eden, who uh, worked on fishing boats, Maury Lynch, who built and uh, maintained a lot of fishing boats and this is the stuff he swore by, although he mainly used this on, on decks. He got it I believe from CH Smith Marine who are big in Victoria and uh, Tasmania and it's still available, uh, still Australian made. Uh, you can get it on the web. You can also get a British product uh, in in Sydney. I got this from Classic Boat Supplies in uh, Belrose. And this is, a, again, a beautiful cotton to use, nice and soft. I've got to say, I do like this stuff, and I had just about enough to uh, do the whole boat. It, the balls come in around about 400 grams or so, but it's a bit under a pound. Now some shipwrights will always prime the seams before hammering the corking in. I'm not convinced that this is always a necessary idea. It may be necessary on some timbers that I haven't worked with, but the main reason given for priming the seams is to protect the cotton against rotting. But I've pulled rotten cotton out of just as many seams that were primed as those that haven't been primed. I've done it sometimes in the past, but I won't be doing it on this boat. My advice to you is to do whatever the best shipwrights in your local area do. You'll need at least a couple of proper corking irons and you can still get these both second hand and brand new on the web. I bought these plus some others and a couple of mallets in a box from a shipwright who had done his time at a navy yard up the Parramatta River during the Second World War years. Most of these are stamped H. Summers Concord which was a suburb near where he worked they, uh, Summers must have been the local blacksmith. I used just these two irons for 90% of the work on this boat, seeing most of the seams are quite narrow. This one is less than one millimetre at the end, maybe 30 second of an inch. This one is about a millimetre and a half, about 16th of an inch. You should use the thickest iron that will fit in the seam without jamming. If you jam it in the seam, you'll be tending to damage the sides of the seams. This one I used in a couple of spots. It's three millimetres or an eighth of an inch across the end and has a crease filed in the end, 
which gives the desired effect on the, uh, on the corking material. In bigger boats and wider seams there are thicker irons. This one has a single crease, it's about a quarter of an inch wide at the top. This one has a double crease, it's a little bit uh, narrower. This one, even though it's only about four millimetres across, three sixteenths of an inch, it has a double crease filed in it. Bent or cranked irons are used in deck work, close to deck furniture, where you wouldn't be able to get a straight hit. Narrower irons are used in nib ends. There's even in this kit was a little homemade one out of a, out of a spike. It's best to use a proper corking mallet. You may find second-hand ones on the web or in antique stores. You can still buy new ones on, from some sources on the web. Or you can make your own from the hardest, most dense timber you can find. All have tapered rings fitted to the, both ends of the head. You're likely to see plenty of the American type, especially on YouTube. My eldest son, also a shipwright, picked this one up in America when he was working there 20 years ago. The American-made ones are usually nicely turned, so they're round all the way along. This one is black locust, a timber that we don't see very much of here. Here in Australia, we've always followed the English style, where the middle section where the handle goes through is flat on the top and the bottom, and both ends are, are turned down. My favourite mallet over many years has been this one. It's done uh, a lot of work, and it's nearing the end of its useful life. I even lost one of the rings on a decking job when it, uh, it, it came off and fell overboard, failed the gloop test. It was one of the ones that I got uh, in this original kit 40 years ago. The other one that was in the kit was an absolutely beautiful mallet. The head was made from lignum vitae. Uh, it was a beautifully balanced mallet, beautiful looking mallet. Unfortunately, some person of low moral fibre walked into my shop about 25 years ago and disappeared with it. I hope you've got some decent use out of it, you bastard. All of these weigh just over a kilogram with their handles, about two and a half pounds, which seems to be fairly standard, but they're a little bit heavy for small yacht work. So on my boat here, I've been using this European style one, which is... Uh, about 900 grams, about two pounds. It's just about the, exactly the right amount of heft for the kind of work for the seams that I've been doing here. Uh, an old Greek guy wandered into my shop about 15 years ago and gave me this among some other tools. The head is made from bull oak or she oak, one of the casuarina species with a very distinct grain pattern. The English, Australian and American mallets all have this feature of a slot in the head, both sides of the handle. This is alleged to give some sort of spring to the head, but its, its main effect is to give a distinctive ring to each mallet. This sound helps you to sense the hardness of the corking. There's a particular note when the corking is fully hardened up. The distinctive note also helps the foreman tell who's doing good work and who's slacking off. The European mallets generally don't have this feature, but there's still a distinctive sound when you've hardened up properly. I think the feel of the, of the iron on the cotton is more important than the sound, although both are important. Whatever type you use, ear protection is important. Some mallets are louder than others, but all of them are loud enough to require ear protection. If you've only got a little bit of corking to do, you can get away with using any wooden mallet. But most of these are too light and you have to hit a bit harder and the action is actually more tiring than if you're using a slightly heavier mallet. Sometimes you'll find the area you're working in is too restricted to use a long-headed mallet. In that case, I've often used this dead blow mallet which has about the right amount of heft. Corking mallets always had a removable handle because they were always stored in a box like this. Simply drop it in and, and it's ready to go. The nine strand cotton I'm using is too thick to go in most of the seams on this boat. Some seams only take three strands, some will take four or five and so on. I'm going to pull out about five or six feet, just under two metres. Good length to, a good length to handle. I'm going to separate the twisted strands. They're very strong as they are like that. Even a single strand is <laughs> even a single strand when it's twisted has a bit of strength in it. If you untwist it, 
it separates very easily. So again, twist and separate. This will get all, all nine strands separated. And for these seams I'm going to do here, I need four strands. So I'm going to take off four of that and I'm going to peel them out and allow the allow the rest of it to dangle down so that it spins away. If you try to do this with longer stuff, it just bunches up and it's it's almost impossible. It's just frustrating to do. So that's the main reason I tend to do it in round two metre lengths. You can twist it into the previous tuft and hammer that into the seam till it's secure. Then stretch it out and spin it. Some shipwrights measure out enough to do the whole length of the seam. Pin it at one end and spin the whole length. I've always found it easier to do it in shorter lengths. The cotton I'm using came spun right-handed like most rope, so when I spin it, I go the same way. The British cotton is spun left-handed, so when I use that, I'll spin it left-handed. Pin it along the seam with plenty of slack. Don't worry too much about how much slack, you can adjust it as you go. Pin the nearest section to the start, about 300 to 500 mil along, about a foot to a foot and a half, and then choke it into the seam with a narrow bladed iron. Then come back over it the other way to harden up, using the widest iron that will fit in the seam without jamming against the sides. It's not really important whether you work from right to left or left to right, I vary depending on what suits me at the time. Now I'm setting it into the seam. I'm rocking the iron backwards and forwards, rock it back to lift up onto the next bit of cotton. Hit it, rock it back, move it forward, back, forward. That's the slow motion of it in order to keep the iron in the seam. If the iron comes out of the seam and you're hitting rapid blows, you may damage the edge of the seam. Now, I haven't caught myself doing this on film at this point, uh, but here's one I prepared earlier. If it's going reasonably easily, I tend to just do it in single blows. If it's a little bit firmer, and I have to make sure that I'm staying in the seam, a tap and blow just helps make sure it's in the seam. And then back to harden up. Now the most important thing about hardening up is that your blows are even, that the so that the cotton is compressed exactly the same amount all the way along the seam. If you find that it's going a bit deeper in places, this is not a problem. The depth is way less important than the density of the cotton. If it goes more than halfway through the plank, well, first off, you have to check that it's not not coming through the seam on the inside, which is a big no-no. You've got to rip that out. This happens especially on repair work or, or re recorking older boats that the cotton will go through. And that really is a matter of pulling out the offending area, adding way more cotton in, putting it back in so that it won't knock, so that you won't be able to knock it through. Now this generally means adding more strands and 
twisting it a bit more firmly so it becomes more rope-like, more solid, and simply won't be big enough to, well, sorry, simply won't be small enough to be hammered through. The worst thing you can do, and the most common mistake, is to try to hammer in too much cotton at a particular point. If the seam narrows or for whatever reason there's too much cotton at a particular point, you really have to rip it out, reduce the amount of cotton and get it back in so it's roughly the same depth as the rest of it. Because the worst thing you can do is hammer a hard bunch of cotton in, which will actually push the plank apart there, wedge the plank apart, and you'll find it leaking either side of that later on. So the evenness of the hardening up is the most important point in corking. The depth, in a perfect world, the depth would be perfectly nice and even all the way along. On most boats, they're not perfect, including mine, and the depth will vary slightly. Now, this is not a problem as long as you have enough depth to hold the seam, seam compound in. If the seam compound uh, doesn't have enough depth, it will simply fall out quite quickly. You need to have the depth of the seam greater than the width of the seam so that there's enough seam compound in there to grip onto both planks and not come out. When you're hardening up, you can really feel if it's still driving into the seam. You can even hear it. It sounds softer. It sounds duller. When you've got it nice and even and hard, there's a constant feel and a constant noise all the way along. The noise does vary, of course, by whatever you, whatever backing you have, ribs, floors, keel, whatever structure it is there. It sounds obviously more hollow in areas that aren't closely backed up. But... If you still feel that it's dull and driving in, you've got either you've either got to rip it out and try again, or just add more if it's not going through. Seams aren't always the same width all the way along, particularly when recorking older boats. So you often need to add or subtract strands. Simply unspin the bit you have left and add the new strand and spin it all together. Or if reducing, tear off a strand and then re-spin it. The traditional and best way to hold the iron is with your palm towards you, mostly because it hurts less when you hit it. But you'll get yourself into positions where you simply can't do it that way and you have to hold it any way you can. When starting a seam again where I left off, I often twist the new strand into the old strand as I showed before, but that's not really necessary. I often just taper the start of the new strand over a few inches and hammer it in, then I tape at the end of the old strand and lay it over the top. There's no real reason you couldn't lay the aft strand over the forward one. I'm just in the habit of always laying any joint of timber like a scarf joint or anything else on a boat with the forward part over the aft part, a good general principle to follow. I tend not to join sections exactly in line on adjacent seams from old habits as well, but there's no real reason why you couldn't do that either. You can still loop twisted cotton in like the Americans do and like we do with oakum. It's an especially useful technique when seam width varies a great deal as it often does when recorking older boats. I'm told this is often done by shipwrights in Victoria and I've often done it in repair work. 
you can adjust the amount of cotton going into the seam by the closeness of the loops. If you find you've got too much, it's not a big deal to pull it out and do it again. At the plank ends, at stem and stern, the traditional way is to separate the cotton into a little moustache with one part going one way and the other the other way. Then you lay a continuous strand over the top. The nib ends of steeler planks and butt blocks, if you have them, are done in a similar fashion. Now I've got a nib end here in the end of a steeler plank. I've done the seams down to here. I've done the garbage seam. I've done this one up to here. But I can't run this through along the top of the garbage because I need to at least start this seam down through here and spread it there in a little moustache, as you'll see in a sec, and then go over it with the continuous line there. And as for speed, well, speed only comes with experience. The best guys I've ever seen are the guys that cork tally-ho in Port Townsend. Now, they're always working on very large fishing boats, doing a lot of corking, and they are the best in the world, absolutely. When you're starting out, don't try to rush it. It's better to just naturally build that up as you build up the skill. It's much more important to get it right as you go along. My personal benchmark is when I can get up to a rate of singing along with Otis Redding's Try a Little Tenderness. Now there's just two more seams to go with cotton along here. But before I do that, I'm going to do the oakum in the garbage seam. Even though with new work, there's negligible amount of movement in the planks when you wedge them with from the wedging effect of, of corking, there probably is still some minuscule effect. So I want to get this garbage seam, which is a fairly narrow seam anyway, I want to get that done first. And then if these ones tighten up on it anymore, well, that's, that's just all the better. But I wouldn't want them to compress that seam and make it even harder to get the oakum into that seam. Uh, oakum comes in a roll long, grassy and fibrous. I'm going to tear off about the amount I need in length. Remember, you can easily join it. Get rid of the ball. But this is way too thick for my purposes. I'm only using quite a thin strand. So I'm going to just tear off about a third of that is about right. Find about a third of it. Oh, that's. Yep. I'll separate out that. And then it needs to be rolled and teased out if necessary. Now, it's not being twisted, it's not actually being spun. Well, years ago, you could actually get oakum in in a spun yarn. But these days, just off the ball, you roll it just backwards and forwards and evening it out to make a reasonably even, round sort of a rope. If you get thick bits, you can sort of tease them out. If you get thin bits, well, just roll them and you can bunch them up. You can loop them more when you're putting it in. 
and then you can put it in a box or you can just make a small ball out of it then put it in a box or put it in your pocket or anywhere else I like to put it in my pocket it does make your hands and your shirts and your leg where you're rolling all smell of Stockholm tar but I don't really mind that smell and because this is quite a tight seam even though as I said there's negligible movement in the wood I'm going to use this wedge shaped iron to open out the seam a little just hammering it in is going to compress the fibres a little not much on the spotted gum but it'll compress the edge of the hue and pine a bit just leave a slightly more open seam in order to hammer the oakum in. The reason I'm using oakum in the garbage seam is that all the old shipwrights always maintained that spotted gum didn't like them, that it would spew it out. So they always used oakum if the planking or just the keel was spotted gum. So I'm just sticking to tradition. And I'm actually for what it's worth, going to leave that in there until I get up to that point, just as a wedge to keep it apart. Who knows? So oakum isn't twisted in, it's looped in. And as I said, this is the way that in the USA they use the cotton as well. Just a series of loops and you can adjust the number of loops and the closeness of the loops in order to gauge how much uh, how much oakum you need to put into the seam. I'm stretching this out a bit with not very close loops because I don't think that there's going to be very much room in there to get, get it all in if I make the loops too thick. Go back along and harden it up. That lot went in a bit deep there. It's about three quarters of the way through the plank. So it's all obviously bunching up right at the back of the seam. It's a bit shallower there and shallower there. So I'm just going to add another little bit of oakum in there just to build it out a bit. There's no danger of it going through there because there's a solid back rabbit up to about there. Solid spotted gum, so it's not going anywhere. It must be just compressing right at the very back of the seam. Yep, still plenty of room in there for seam compound. The same day you hammer in the corking, you need to prime the seams and the cotton or oakum for several reasons. Firstly, the primer keeps the cotton compressed as it has a tendency to decompress or fluff out, especially in humid weather. And secondly, it prevents the cotton from soaking up the oil in the seam compound and leaving it dry and crumbly.
Now we need to pay the seams. And I'm going to use standard linseed oil putty. There's lots of choices. There are all sorts of proprietary seam compounds. There's polyurethanes. There's also various concoctions of hydrated lime and fish oil. Others uh, involving Portland cement and quite a few secret recipes about. I'm not looking for an argument. I'm just using linseed oil putty because I've always done so and never had a problem with it. My advice is to do whatever the best shipwrights in your area do on your type of boat. So this is what I'm using, just standard linseed oil putty. Normal window, window putty. Sometimes there's a bit of a skin that's formed on top. Yep, there is one there, so we'll just get rid of that because that's stuff that's already cured and you don't want that there. The rest of it, yep, that looks pretty good. And then it's worth kneading it a bit just to even it out. Checking it just to make sure that it doesn't have too much in the way of skin left on it, or any at all. It should be just starting to stick to your hands. Anything drier than that gets a bit hard to work into the seams. Um, anything wetter than that uh, becomes really annoying to use because it's sticking to you all, all the time. I'll normally take it, work on a bit about that size. Easy enough to hold in my hand. Roll into a sort of sausage that we start applying, as I'll show you in a sec. If it does stick to your hands too much, you can always dip your hands into a little bit of talc and that just that keeps the surface dry of your hands dry and stops it sticking for a while uh, you don't want to use too much talc or too often otherwise the talc begins to dry out the putty as well now the best guys for applying putty are the guys that do windows because they are just so used to rolling it out into just exactly the right width and putting it in I've never done enough of it to do it as well as the guys that do windows if it's a bit dry for working, you could always add a little bit of linseed oil to it. Knead it out thoroughly. If it's so dry that there's lumpy bits in it, it's probably best to throw it away and start again with a new batch. Now the technique I've always used is to roll it into a bit of a sausage. Then hold the sausage just above the seam you're working on. And force it into the seam like that. The technique is to twist the putty knife to force the putty right to the back of the seam, forcing all the air out. The worst thing you can do is trap air behind the putty. Then you come back over it with the blade held at a low angle with plenty of pressure and then slice off the excess. Some guys don't slice off the excess. They leave it for a long time to dry and I'm talking many weeks and they sand it likely and then prime and paint over and that sometimes works out perfectly but often it doesn't. I like to slice off the excess and then smooth it out with a finger. This leaves it slightly below the surface and then above the waterline I prime it once it's skinned then add a traditional stopping made from primer thickened with talc. This sands easily and in most cases the seams just disappear. If they don't, I apply a few coats of high build undercoat and add further stopping made from undercoat thickened with talc. This will leave my topside seams very difficult to see, at least on launch day. For all underwater seams, I add a small amount of anti-fouling paint to the putty because there's lots of little critters out there that like to eat linseed oil putty. And this apparently ruins the taste for them. Always wear gloves when handling this stuff. The sole purpose of anti-fouling paint is to kill life.
The technique for applying it is exactly the same. Sometimes when working with the underwater putty, the paint seems to start to dry the putty out and you need to add a little linseed oil to get it workable again. I don't bother to add any stopping below the waterline because the planking will swell and squeeze out a bit of putty anyway and we'll worry about that at the first annual slipping. I recorded about 115 hours in caulking and paying this hull, but now it's all done and it's a bit of a milestone. So I'm going to celebrate by using one of my favourite caulking irons that I picked up from Mead Chandler of Ship's Company Forge at the Port Townsend Wooden Boat Festival a few years ago. Mead makes beautiful caulking irons and sends them all around the world. This is one of my favourites. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon on Smithy's Boat Shed.